live free uh, or die you know uh, manifest yourself to the greatest extent that you could possibly be uh, and and help others to achieve the same uh, and I, I think one of the best ways of doing that especially in the modern age is to develop free software man these this is this is like you know we're just scratching the surface of the uh, of, of what awesome shit we could build no and I mean Bitcoin is cool wabi sabi is cool lightning is cool but it's nothing. This is all just a blip, you know, a small blip in the dust of, of what we could possibly achieve. And especially because we have you know, bullish as fuck people like me and countless others uh, who, who dedicate their lives onto creating these, these new standards and uh, to, to manifest this sovereign and free and private reality. <laughs> I mean, it's just a joke. All these central bankers, all the status, they have no fucking chance against the fire and the passion that burns in the heart of every one of us. Welcome to the Vani Podcast, the podcast making you invulnerable to the coercion of the state and the servile society. I'm your host, Shane, coming to you from the Free Republic of Pasnia, the self liberator's paradise. Uh, as always, the website is Pasnia, P A Z N I A dot com. Uh, if, you're, if you'd like to learn more about what we're building here, uh, which, you know, very, very briefly, a vetted decentralized network of self sufficient permanent autonomous zones. Uh, and if you like what you see, please do consider becoming a stakeholder. Uh, there's there's so much happening. Uh, there there really is. Uh, I was mentioning to to Matt. I, I, I guessed uh, Max uh, in pre-show are kind of getting getting ready for winter. Uh, the animals aren't for range anymore. They're they're put up, and uh, we're yep. Yeah, I guess really just preparing for for what's to come in the spring. But um, I guess also just a, a couple other developments I'll mention in brief is uh, you know we're working on Pasnia silver coins, uh, which uh, you know by way of the Pasnia mint they're they're in the works. Um, yeah, as, as I mentioned in a couple of, couple of previous episodes, a rife healing device is incoming uh, that I cannot wait to start experimenting with. And uh, Dab's giving our celebration of gratitude for our free zones is coming up the following week. Uh, to name just a few things that we're doing here, uh, what's going on here at the Free Republic. But uh, again, the website is Paznia.com uh, if you want to join this Paznia Second Realm Network. Uh, today, we continue. Uh, we'll continue our ongoing crypto anarchism series with another discussion on Bitcoin privacy uh, with returning guest and friend of the podcast, Max Hillebrand. Uh, some may be aware uh, there have been some incredible privacy innovations uh, as of late, namely Taproots. Uh, there's also Wabi Sabi, a feature of Wasabi Wallet 2.0, a project he's been involved with for, for some time. Uh, we've talked about these new, uh, in, before. Um, I think we've talked about Taproot pretty in depth before too, but um, you know that was a you know a couple a year to year or two ago, and uh, I guess it was more theoretical there. So it's happened now, um, and uh, it's it's here. We'll get the scoop on all those updates, uh, and even uh, you know pertinent pertinently to this podcast, uh, we'll hear about how the van life is going uh, for him, and uh, yeah, whatever else whatever else we get to. So Max, without further ado, man, uh, welcome back to the Vani Podcast. Uh, how are you doing today? Well, thank you very much, Rayo, again for the invite. As always, it's a pleasure to speak with you and to share uh, our knowledge here with the peers of the Pasnias around the world. Uh, <laughs> I'm really excited. Uh, there's there's always so much rapid development and progress going on, not just in Bitcoin, but, but you know everywhere with freedom technologies. So to keep up with this is a full-time job, and that's why Shane and me exist, so that we make it easier for the, our listeners right, to uh, kind of load off some of the uh, keeping up with all the rapid innovation work <laughs> uh, and to give you the kind of highlights and snippets, the, the action points that you need to uh, actually keep up. Uh, so I'm, I'm eager. Mm -hmm. Yes, yes, and, and obviously uh, I had someone respond on Twitter uh, someone who just uh, followed me from uh, a recent article put, uh, that I contributed to Agoras Nexus. He wants to hear more about, you know, practical stuff. Um, and uh, so I, I do want to obviously make sure, you know, as per this podcast, we're always about, uh, you know, not just talking about uh, things that can liberate you, but we're all about the actual action portion of it. So, um, yeah, I'd, I'd obviously, uh, when we get into these discussions, I'd love to hear, you know, um, we'll get into some of the, the action stuff too, but I, I guess, I guess first off, man, it's been, I don't even remember the last, the last, I didn't even check, didn't even, didn't even think to check, uh, when the last pod, the last conversation we, we had was, but, uh, how's, how's the end of 21, been, uh, 2021 been treating you? Uh, how's the van life go? How's the uh, van nomad life going? And, uh, I guess we'll start there. Oh, it's been really an incredible year or, or actually an incredible two years, I must say. Uh, you know, it's funny, even though the world kind of went to shit in many regards, or maybe dis despite or because of that, rather, 
um, you know, if you've prepared yourself well, not just physically, but also, you know, mentally, uh, then you can not just survive in such a weird reality, but even thrive in it. Mm -hmm. And this is really something that uh, gave me a lot of hope uh, recently that uh, despite so much craziness and tyranny going on, I've rarely or I've rarely felt as free or as, as powerful uh, with with my abilities and the technologies around me. It, 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 yeah, it's, it's really incredible. Uh, and, if, and, you know, one thing is, is just using the stuff uh, or these technologies. But the other thing, of course, is building them. And this is really where I just see in the last two years. I mean, not just the teams that I'm very intimately involved in, but really so many people have just crunched an incredible amount of, of progress and work in a very short time. And that's exactly what we need, uh, it, that the urgency uh, is, at, is, is evident for everyone. Right? Um, I think this is one of the kind of shining beacons of hope for me, at least, that in the last couple of years, I've had... Uh, the number of people who now understand and uh, value the anarchist principles has increased drastically. You know, so many people who before were just the default Keynesians and default statists are now understanding uh, that this that something is terribly wrong. And just understanding that something is wrong is a very depressing thing on itself. But if you then also discover tools that help you in the situation that is currently very wrong, then that's an incredibly hopeful and um, yeah, ex exhilarating feeling. You know, and many people realize now what's th that something is wrong, and therefore they go and look for technologies that do manifest freedom in their lifetimes. And since we, the cypherpunks, have built these technologies for years now or decades now, uh, they get to a state where they're easier to use, much faster and more efficient, uh, and, and in general, just much more powerful. And so this this is kind of all slotted into place over these last couple months or, or years. And even though I'm still not sure if we're ready or if, if there even is such a thing as being fully <laughs> ready, um, I feel rather confident. Yeah, yeah, and, and and you make a good point too because uh, obviously over on Liber Libertarian Attack Radio we start talking about we did the direct actions here started that in you know the end of 2015 so like even then like a lot of these things were, were more theoretical for me like there wasn't a drastic need to to completely withdraw from the first realm right um, it was it was still you know still somewhat uh, you know still somewhat uh, um, somewhat not as not a, it was it's not as dangerous as how I'll put it um, but uh, but yeah um, the past couple of years the, the, the urgency is definitely it definitely shown and and uh um it's it's yeah it's good to see a lot of the a lot of these strategies that were were kind of rare um back then i remember me coming across the first fan nomad at a freedom festival in 2015 i actually just emailed me today and he'll be stopping by in a, in a couple of weeks but uh he was talking about he was like the only van the only van lifer i knew at that time and and now there's there's uh there's there's uh, you know plenty of van nomads uh, plenty of van nomads all over all over the world it seems um, there's plenty of folks, uh, or I guess uh, I know at least a number of folks that are living on sailboats or that are working towards, you know, permanent floating voluntary, you know, societies. And, um, and obviously technology has a role in, in all of these things. And, and, uh, um, it's, it's awesome to see the de development in that realm too. It's not, it's not, um, since the crypto anarchy series that I spent a year and a half or two years, on, I pretty much, pretty much focus on the crypto anarchist sphere for, for quite some time. And, uh, you know, obviously realize the importance the the critical need, if we're going to be, you know, using these technologies, if we're going to be using, um, the internet and these these communications protocols, then, then goddamn it, encryption is important, and uh, all of these other things that come with it. Uh, you know, um, you know, anonymous, decentralized money, um, all these things are, are critically important. So, um, yeah, it's 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 uh, it's definitely a, a new world per se. Um, but uh, obviously, uh, you know, we've got different visions than uh, than those who falsely imagine themselves to be our rulers. So I guess um, uh, the the other introductory question I'll ask uh, ask here, Max, is uh, um, well, actually, the, uh, one of the last conversations we had was on uh, you were talking about uh, how you lived on lived uh, you know on Bitcoin primarily. So, um, are you still you know primarily uh, you know living on Bitcoin only? And uh, how, how's that going? Is there any been any additional challenges with what's been transpiring, or maybe it's been even easier? Who knows? No, that's pretty much business as usual for me now. You know, I, I choose to work only with people or, or with customers who, who pay me in Bitcoin. Uh, I don't like to be insulted with someone throwing shit in my face. <laughs> and I'm not going to pick up that habit again. Um, you know, and that 
I mean, true. You you limit yourself to the people who are who have Bitcoin and who are willing to give it to you, which you know, arguably is a very small number, especially that they're willing to give it to you. Uh, but but still, you know, it's uh, it's you know, you you always want to curate the people that you have around you, and I think it's just underestimated how important it is to curate your customer base too. Uh, because ultimately, those are the people that you provide a service for, right? Those are the people that you help, um, that, that you encourage, and that, that you are an integral part of manifesting their life to, to the extent that they would like to live it. So if you work with, uh, well, fascists and uh, people who are not just, you know, in, 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 not just with the intent, but in their actions and in reality, uh, manifesting a tyranny for you, well, why do you help these people, right? So, so everyone who still is on the fiat standard is actively stealing from everyone else. That's not good. And people need to get that right up in their face. Uh, hey, stop stealing, period. And if you do, I don't like you and I don't want to help you. And I'm not going to do that, right? So this, this, it's a very powerful way to, uh, or it's a very powerful way to discriminate uh, whom you mm -hmm. work with um, and it, it just happens that many people who are in Bitcoin share the same values uh, that, that I do or that other freedom loving individuals have. Um, and then this is a, this is at least in this early stage of the development of this money, it's just a great way, a, a very easy way to filter out all the bullshit customers uh, and, and only focus on the real ones, right? But it's, it's not just how you get paid, right? It's also whom do you pay, right? Uh, whom uh, do you actually, you know, support with your monetary contributions? Mm -hmm. uh, and that's, that's the, you know, that's, you don't want to be the guy who, who throws shit in the face of other people naturally. Right. Uh, so if, if you want to work with people on a mutual respect basis, um, where, where you truly value the work that they do and you, you, you don't want to wiggle out of paying them, right. It's, it's an honor to pay people who've, who've done a meaningful work for you mm -hmm. and with Bitcoin, you know, what higher level of gratitude could you possibly give to someone else than this magical, precious cyberspace money? And just because it is this, this in, in, like cr crazy valuable gesture, you know, to send someone Bitcoin, when you do it, people are happy. They're incredibly happy that they now have something that they can protect for generations. And so it, it fosters this entire next level of loyalty in, in people that that will always feel that now I'm actually being respected and and appreciated. And, and th this is, again, with whom do you want to work with, right? Not just whom do you work for, but which people do you want to have working for you? And here again, get out uh, of the statist relationships, escape the first realm as soon as possible and as swiftly as possible. Uh, and naturally you can only do that if you don't, well, don't use fiat money to pay for goods and services uh, so we've we've seen of course in the last year more and more entrepreneurs demanding to be paid in bitcoin um for both the the services that they provide um you know like uh, you know just labor contracts or whatever but also for the goods that they provide uh, you know your food your raw materials your machineries and the more we foster the second realm on a sound monetary standard, the sooner we can benefit as a macro economy from division of labor and the, the efficiencies that a sound monetary economy brings you. And so the, the sooner we get uh, both or as many people involved in this monetary network, the better we can then allocate resources throughout time in this very uncertain future. Um, it, it's, it's again critical, right? If, if we don't fix the fiat malinvestments and overconsumptions, then regardless of how, you know, then the world is literally going to burn into pieces. So we, we need to check our resource consumptions and uh, we need to very carefully choose where to invest our capital and how to transform our specific capital or our generic capital into specific capital and, and machinery. And in a fiat standard, that's just not possible to do efficiently. But in a sound monetary standard, it is. And then with Bitcoin, we finally have that opportunity to actually manifest that sound money that will help us to allocate resources. And this is so crucial, right? Because um, we only with sound money do you have an, an accurate this, this, uh, depiction of what is your current state of capital? You know, how many resources do you have under your control? 
Uh, and only when you truly know that can you make an est or a good estimate of where it is best to apply your resources and your capital. And so this is this is crucial. And any long term project that seriously wants to um, survive and profit and, and be prosperous, you cannot do that on a fiat standard. And the sooner we get all these projects onto a Bitcoin standard, the sooner we can actually uh, stop the dilution of the fiat economy and re-manifest reality. Yeah, yeah, and well said. Definitely, yeah, definitely, definitely well said. Um, I guess one of those hurdles, and this some, I mentioned to you in pre-show that I wanted to, to cover this first before we even got into the privacy innovations, but, you know, one of the hurdles uh, to the Bitcoin standard is, uh, you know, well, altcoins, shitcoins, and uh, all that's all that's happening there. So um, I, I, I this 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 came up. I, I added to the outline today. Um, there was, I was there's some some folks who are you know they know that we're really you know heavy into privacy, right? Like very privacy focused, security culture focused. Not there aren't really many people more security and privacy focused than than, uh, than us, Max. If I if I if I would say so, other than you know hardcore cyberpunks. But point um, going with that point, um, they're kind of they're kind of surprised that uh, um, you know they're they're privacy focused folks who you know are are kind of BTC only. So um, I, I want to start with that. Um, um, with uh, I, I guess, uh, why why are you BTC only? Um, why, why why don't you uh, you know why don't you mess with anything else? And, and you kind of already laid out why why, why uh, a lot of reasons, but but why why BTC only? Yeah, that's a great question. And uh, you know, to to be or to, to articulate my answer to that point, I, I would start out with that I'm I'm not a privacy maximalist. Um, privacy is not my my starting point. It's not the end goal that I want to achieve either. I, privacy is a means to an end. Uh, what what I am, however, is a property rights maximalist. And that's my that's my ultimate conclusion, you know. And it starts with the axiom of individual human action. Um, and and this is where I am rigorous, right? This is this is what I focus on in as my macro strategy, and right? to to ensure that individuals have their property rights protected. Privacy is just the natural conclusion that happens when you have good property rights. And so privacy is the ability to selectively reveal yourself to the world and so that you have a choice of how to act in front of other people. And you see how closely that is tied into human action, right? Because, or, or, and also to freedom, right? Because a free man cannot have privacy. And if you don't have privacy, you're not a free man. You're a slave because you no longer get to choose how you can act in front of other people. So other people get to make that choice for you and uh, they spy on you and, and try to lure you into acting in a way that you would not have acted otherwise. It's, it's ultimately coercion. So that's, that's why like, I'm, I don't optimize for privacy, I optimize for property rights. And out of that, privacy emerges. And how, so how does this tie into Bitcoin? Making private payments in cyberspace is a solved problem since 1983. Chaumian eCash was in invented at that stage, and that gives you perfect privacy uh, at incredibly scale and speed and very efficient in computation. Um, but why don't we use eCash nowadays everywhere? Well, because these people prioritize privacy over property rights in the sense that even though a user had perfect privacy here, he could not verify the integrity of his property rights. A user in this eCash system has to fully trust the central third party, the issuer, the mint of this token uh, to define, verify, and enforce the monetary integrity or, or the property right rules uh, of this monetary system. And so this trusted third party can censor people, you know, just uh, basically go away, you know, take, uh, take all the money and leave. Um, and they can also increase the token supply. Right? by literally and increasing the token supplies is not even expensive you can create billions of signatures per second uh, and each of these signatures are tokens you know uh, so um in inflation is is rampant and you need to trust that that this third party is not inflating the money supply and even worse if that third party does you cannot even notice it right because this is a perfectly anonymous system so where these old ecash systems failed it was not on privacy it was not on speed it was on security and verification. And, and this is where Bitcoin comes in. Bitcoin is not a payment mechanism. It doesn't try to excel at making private payments. It excels at verifying payments. 
and it verifies payments in a way that you don't just val validate the integrity of every spending transaction per se. And so that the actual owner of this coin has agreed or authorized to spend this coin. You also th validate as a second order effect, the entire money supply, right? Um, and that's just crucial that not a trusted third party, but every individual user defines, verifies, and enforces the property rules of a monetary system. And so Bitcoin is not a payment making machine. It's a payment verification machine. But the, the crucial downside here, of course, is you can only verify what you know. And therefore, Bitcoin cannot be a perfectly private system. Uh, because in a perfectly private system, you don't know about the transactions that are going on which is great for privacy, but horrible for verification, right? <laughs> um, and, and that's this very delicate trade-off that Bitcoin makes. You know, we do sacrifice a lot of privacy. Um, users cannot choose to not reveal their Bitcoin payment transactions because then other people cannot verify it. And right? so if you want to make a Bitcoin payment, you need to tell other people that you're making a Bitcoin payment. And that choice is taken away from you, right? So it, it does actually decrease privacy. But that comes at the ineffable benefit of verifying every single payment and therefore the money supply. So, but that doesn't mean that Bitcoin privacy is broken, right? It just means that there is a, a natural constraint on our system. But, you know, humans, if we would have unbounded opportunities, we would no longer be humans, right? What, what makes us humans is that we venture out into the unbounded areas and and we we bring order into chaos, right? We we set boundaries, we build our walled gardens, we conceptualize and we categorize, and th this is what 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 Bitcoin does do, right? We we set a a, a kind of an, a it is arbitrary, but it is nevertheless a limit, right? Every transactions need to be verified by everyone else. So it's, it's a massive limit, but inside this limit. Um, humans have the opportunity to, to excel in their creativity of how to operate within the constraints of a given system. And this is what, what, this is the, the ability that really makes us human. And so it doesn't mean that just because Bitcoin privacy is inherently limited, that it is impossible to achieve. Yes, there's a limit that you cannot choose to, to make a payment without telling others. But that doesn't mean that you cannot make a payment that's super weird for other people to, to analyze. And, and, and this is the, the art of Bitcoin privacy. And to, to still, you're never anonymous, right? You, you, you will always reveal something. But the little things that you do reveal can be optimized in a way that the actual density of, of real sensitive information, like your name, like the, the payment amounts and, and uh, you know, destinations, transaction graphs and such, all of these things can be optimized uh, to confuse a potential attacker uh, into no longer being able to identify you and to attribute certain actions to a certain person. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. And uh, that was, uh, I, I guess, uh, um, yeah, that's basically basically my my uh, uh, my answer too. I wouldn't have put it exactly that way. But I, just, I, I yeah, appreciate that. Um, but yeah, I just uh, I, I appreciate that with with a lot of um, with uh, um, I think what's what's the Bitcoin blockchain now like seven hundred gigabytes or something along those lines. Um, with, uh, with with other with other coin with other coins. I mean, to be able to actually you know to to download every transaction and verify it yourself. And obviously, there there um, I guess there are ways to to expedite that. But to actually be able to verify the entire transaction record yourself, um, the it just it becomes pretty much unfeasible for the average person um, when you're talking about uh, you know when you're talking about that that much storage. So I I, I appreciate um, I I really appreciate just the the ability and the ease especially now it's becoming it's becoming super easy to for someone to just to, to run their own full node um a, a lot of the stuff is just you know one click installs you know through one one user interface so the simplicity is the simplicity is coming down and uh yeah i'm right there with you just be, be not having to trust anybody at any point in the process being able to verify everything yourself um and uh i'm, I'm not sure if that yeah i'm not sure if that could be said for for really uh really uh i guess any other any other asset um, at least not not in this category Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's, it's, it's very true, right? And these are very difficult trade-offs. Um, and I'm, I'm not claiming that Bitcoin made the objectively best decision in this trade-off matrix. 
Um, it, it, you know, the, it, it's very difficult to make such a claim. Um, but w what we can do is, you know, uh, check what are other options. And, you know, one of the, of course, most prevalent privacy coins, if you even want to call them that, um, is, is Monero. Uh, but here are, you know, inherent scalability trade-offs um, with, for example, in, in a Bitcoin transaction, because it is public um, and because or, you know exactly when a certain coin was generated or received, and you know exactly when that coin got spent. Right? So meaning all the coins throughout the history of Bitcoin, you know, many hundreds of thousands of coins probably, well, they are already spent. Right? Um, and there's only a, a small subset of all possible coins that are currently unspent, right? the so-called UTXO set, the unspent transaction output set. And therefore, if you actually want to validate, you can kind of forget all the coins that are already spent. And you only need to remember and track those that are actually unspent. Well, with Monero, because they use what is known as ring signatures, um, instead of basically every transaction having one specific input and one concrete signature or witness uh, to validate this, this payment transaction, in Monero, you choose, I, I believe, something like 40 different coins you know, and, and you take 40 different public keys, for example, and you compute with some beautiful cryptography a, a proof that you do have the private key to spend one of those coins, um, but nobody knows which one out of those 40 you are actually talking about. Right? That's, that's beautiful. So now a verifier no longer needs to know which coin precisely is being spent. You know, great. But the major downside is you can never forget a coin. Right? There is no such a thing as an unspent coin, or sorry, a spent or an unspent coin in Monero. All of them are just coins, and anyone might at any time pick one of the many old coins to include in his new transaction. Mm. Uh, so that just means, you know, you cannot prune your, your state of coins to those that are only unspent. Now, that's, that's just a, that's a, an inherent trade-off in something like ring signatures uh, that will make compute or computing and verifying infinitely more expensive and maybe you don't notice it nowadays when when you use monero but i guess that's because very few people do use monero it's not a hit against monero it's just reality way less monero users than bitcoin users and if we were at a state where there were as many monero users as bitcoin users making as many transactions well we would very quickly realize that uh, it's a it's a big scaling problem I'm not saying that it's impossible to solve it's just going to be much more difficult than in Bitcoin. And this is just one of, of many examples where other projects um, in that trade-off matrix between verification and privacy, basically, uh, choose a more private option. And that's probably a good idea. But the question is, can you really scale it to a, a monetary network? And again, money is the most liquid medium of exchange. That means that every entrepreneur or uh, uh, the staggering majority of all my entrepreneurs demand to be paid in this currency. That means you need a lot of transactions. And it is, I'm, I'm not as certain if a Monero type technology could scale to that extent. It's certainly possible, but it's infinitely more complex and difficult. Yeah. Yeah, definitely, definitely, and um, I know for for me, um, and and this this could this segue very nicely into I guess the first Bitcoin privacy uh, you know improvement uh, improvement as of late. But one of the reasons, uh, or I guess the the main reason why I stopped using Monero a couple few years back, few years back by now, uh, was because you know they they have their and I'm sure maybe they still do it, but it's like every six months there's a new hard fork, and I had an issue syncing to the my my wallet was syncing to the old chain, and it was a major pain with the, using their GUI to to get it. So it was like locked up for six months. I had to try on three or four, three or four different occasions, and I finally figured it out. But it was a major pain. Um, so. Um, yeah, uh, I guess the if if I guess the the way that I, the way that I understand it, uh, Taproot was a soft an, a, a new soft for a new soft work in Bitcoin, um, and I think another thing that would be worthwhile to revisit is um, I guess yeah hard forks versus soft forks, um, and uh, kind of the, the implications there on privacy and um, and and I guess verifiability if you wouldn't mind. Yeah, that's that's really a, another crucial point, right? That. How certain are you that the rules that you follow now will be also adhered to in the future by other merchants in the system? 
Um, and the reason why this is important is because money is fundamentally a tool to remove uncertainty and uneasiness, right? We want to reduce our risk of the future and be more comfortable in the here and now. However, if, if part of the kind of social consensus around a certain currency is that every six months we have breaking changes to our rule set, Right, then the the your assurance that if you fall into a coma now and you wake up in five years or something, you know that the the units of coin that you have today are still eligible and used in a, in the same consensus model five years after, ten years, fifty years after, five generations after. Right, that that certainty is a lot lower when there's just breaking changes everywhere. Right. But that doesn't mean that breaking changes are inherently a bad thing, right? Because, well, you know, humans make mistakes all the time and you will want to fix some mistakes and fixing mistakes backwards compatible is, is very difficult. So it's oftentimes a lot easier to just say, well, screw it. We changed the rules and our new rules are going to be much better. And right? yeah, that, that works. Uh, it, it does. And. It, it might even get you better technologies and features in the short term, you know, like Monero's technologies that has improved incredibly uh, since Genesis block. Um, whereas the Bitcoin stack has arguably made more marginally smaller improvements, it's arguably, but, but still. Um, so you, again, you're right, this is such a trade-off. Like if you want to stay on the cutting edge of privacy, then most likely you can it's very difficult to achieve this in a backwards compatible way. So you will have to break some of the rules. That's great if you prioritize privacy. That's horrible if you prioritize verification. Because if you break the rules, well, then I can no longer validate it. Or when I val validate it, I will realize that you're full of bullshit and that you broke the rules uh, that I defined for myself. So ultimately, that you know pushes you out of consensus. So updating these consensus machines is another crazy complex thing. And one thing that you really have to realize is how incredibly complex it is. I mean, the fact that a whole bunch of anonymous people in cyberspace, all of a sudden, exactly, you know, share uh, the opinion of who owns how much money. And that none of these people, you know, successfully steal from each other and say, well, no, no, I actually own all the money. Right? That, that alone is a bloody miracle. You know, that, that that is even possible is is really, really breathtaking. Um, and going about with a bunch of hard forks, these backwards incompatible rules, it, it kind of pushes it a lot. You know, I'm, I'm already incredibly grateful that the Bitcoin works. But then, you know, changing, you know, the, the turbine of an airplane while it's flying, hmm. are you that comfortable that you yeah. will succeed without crashing? Yeah, that's that's a, a that's a, a good way to put it. Uh, that's that's definitely, um, yeah, definitely a good way to put it. Definitely a good way to put it. So, um, speaking of that, speaking of uh, of, of that soft fork, uh, let's let's talk a little bit about uh, a little bit about Taproot here. Um, I guess uh, um, I can turn it over to you generally, and you can just give it give us an overview. And uh, I, I think the, the the critical elements are the Schnorr signatures and um, maybe the. Uh, I guess Schnorr signatures are the big are, are the big one, but I'll turn it over to you, and you can you can uh, you know fill us in on on this uh, this newest uh, Bitcoin soft fork um, privacy implementation. Yes, Taproot is a bundle of technologies that the more you think about them, the more incredible it is. Um, this it's yeah, it's like seriously, Taproot is very genius, and I've got to appreciate it more and more. Uh, throughout the times. So as you said, the first big change is a change of the signature algorithm. Uh, there are numerous signature algorithms out there. Um, previously, or in, in the older versions of Bitcoin, um, we used the so-called elliptical curve digital signature algorithm, ECDSA, um, a fancy name, but it's it, it basically, you know, that does a couple of things, mainly proving that you know a secret without revealing the secret. And in a way that other people can easily verify that you know a secret without them actually learning the secret either. Mm -hmm. um, that's the gist of a cryptographic signature. And it's, it's one of the pillars in 
cryptography. And Schnorr signatures are probably the most simple way to design a cryptographical signature algorithm. It's incredibly simple. You know, it's multiplying two numbers. That's basically it. <laughs> you know, um, so it's it's very elegant. It it achieves this property to prove something without revealing what you actually know. In in as little complexity as reasonable, um, and that enables a lot of great things. Um, or this ECDSA algorithm that we had in the past was much more complicated, uh, but it did essentially the same thing, just roundabout in a roundabout way. Uh, the reason for that is because the Schnorr, Professor Schnorr, uh, a cryptographer, put out a patent and claimed intellectual property on a math formula, which naturally is a stupid, a stupid status thing to do. Mm -hmm. um, but finally, his uh, state coercion ran out of, of time, and he now no longer has the power of the state to break the bones of people who use math. Um, and therefore, there is no... well. Therefore, you can use this cryptographic algorithm now without having to be afraid uh, that someone is going to show up at your door. And n therefore, a lot of people have now implemented this algorithm in, in different ways and, and used it and you know, refined the, its, its efficiency and, and such. Uh, and it's not a state where it's you know, very useful. Uh, it is as elegant as it ever was. And the software that implements this protocol is better and better than it ever was before, too. So what are some of the things that we can do with this new signature algorithm? Mm -hmm. There are too many to talk about, to be honest, but uh, let's, let's talk about the, the big one, uh, which is to aggregate public keys and to aggregate as, uh, or, or, uh, and, and to create a signature for those aggregated keys. So let's back up a bit. How does it currently work in Bitcoin? And in Bitcoin, whenever you generate an address, this address basically commits to a, a public key. You know, let's, uh, first, let's say there's one public key. And when you want to spend that coin, you need to produce the so-called witness, which is the solution to your script. Right? If your script was a single public key, then your witness is going to be a single signature. Right? And, and with that public key and a signature, every full node can verify that it's correct. And if it's correct, well, then it's a valid transaction. But if you want to have multiple people kind of independently signing off on a transaction, so to say, the way that you do it right now is with multi-signatures. So instead of putting into the script just one public key, you put in three public keys. And you also say that you need to have the signatures of two of those public keys in order to spend the key. And so uh, to spend the coin. So you have three public keys and two signatures are on the blockchain. And therefore, everyone sees all these three public keys, sees two signatures. You can check that these two signatures are valid for two of those pr uh, public keys. And you know that two of them were required. Therefore, it's a valid witness. Therefore, it's a valid transaction. Of course, the problem here is, well, you need to remember three pu public keys and two signatures. That's quite a lot. Uh, and every verifier will know that this is different to a single public key and a single signature. And so people will know that you're using these multi-signature schemes. Plus, it is a lot more expensive to verify them than single signature schemes. And now where Schnorr comes in is that instead of putting these three public keys and two signatures onto the blockchain, what we do is that the three people, Alice, Bob, and Charlie, they talk just among themselves, you know, just three people talking, quote unquote, off chain, you know, they're not talking to any of the other Bitcoin nodes. Um, and these three guys share their public keys among each other. And any one of them can just literally sum up the three public keys. So A plus B plus C, you know, and that equals D, the so called aggregated public key. And so we take three keys and we aggregate them to one. And now we can put that one public key on the blockchain. Great, right? And we've, we've just saved about three times, or well, we've, we're 33% less data on the blockchain, just because instead of three public keys, we had two, or we had one. But the cool thing is, right, that scales even more. Um, for example, in current Bitcoin, you can only put up to 15 public keys in any script of, of a single coin. Well, uh, how many keys can you aggregate off chain? 
I don't know. I I, yeah, how I many? think the largest <laughs> I, 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 I well, it's limited to how much computation power you have. Um, and I, I believe uh, I'm, I'm, this might be bullshit, but I, I think I've heard someone uh, do a one million public key aggregation and actually signed that too. probably took him like a couple hours or days. Uh, but you know, in theory, that's that's very possible. So you could have these humongously huge um, uh, kind of con conglomerates of, of keys, um, just infinitely more efficient, right? So that's how we get the aggregated public key on chain. But how do we get the signature on chain, right? And here again, we can off the blockchain. You know, just talking among our three people here, we can collaboratively sign a a message, any message. Uh, in a way that if you want to produce a valid signature to this valid public key, to this aggregated public key, you actually need to know all of the three secrets and kind of collaborate uh, or every single user signs the same message with their own unique private key in a kind of nuanced way. Uh, and that gives you a single aggregated signature. And now you just put that single aggregated signature on the blockchain next to your single aggregated public key. And every full node now just needs to make that one very simple signature verification check. And that returns either true, meaning sure that public key and that signature match up, meaning that this could only have happened if all of the all of these private keys actually signed the same message. And so it, it does give us the same kind of assurance as Bitcoin multisig gives us, but or in, in, in the old Bitcoin multisig, right, the full nodes had to verify that there were actual three public keys and there were actually two or three signatures, right? But it, there, there wasn't really a cryptographic proof. With these Schnorr signatures, we do have a cryptographic proof, right, that this aggregated public key actually was signed by all the private keys that made it up. Um, and that just basically means that um, we, we again, reduce the verification cost tremendously, right? Full nodes no longer need to verify these large 11 out of 15 multi-signatures or something. You know, they, they just validate one public key and one signature and voila, that's it. Yeah. Yeah, that's, uh, that's, that's incredible. Um, and uh, I, I found it really good. I'll put it, I'll put a link in the show notes, uh, an article a Bitcoin magazine wrote on, um, on Taproot. Um, but uh, yeah, in terms, I mean, we're not, I mean, it's not a privacy one, but yeah, the, the, the space saving is, uh, is, is great. Um, so I guess, um, could you, could you speak to the yeah, privacy yeah, implications but, with Schnorr? Yeah. So as you say, right, this is mainly a space savings, but also it's a privacy upgrade. Right? Because whereas in the past, you must have revealed whether you were using a single SIG or a multi-SIG. Right? Every, every node needed to know that. Whereas now, every node just sees a public key and a signature. And there's no way to find out if that was actually a single user or if that was actually you know, a 500,000 out, out of a million. You know? It all looks the same. Uh, therefore, drastically improving privacy. Right? The, this is one of those few things like those rare technologies that improve not just the, the scalability, but also the privacy of a technology. Like that's, that's quite rare. Right. Um, so it'd be multi-sig and, and this would have an impact on so, lightning too, right? Opening and closing channels. Um, what, what is, does, that, does that have to do with Exactly. Yeah. Okay, great. Exactly. Right. This helps you with, um, with, with just having a, a secure, you know, geographically distributed setup for yourself. Right. So one person, has, doesn't want to have just one hardware wallet in, you know, somewhere in Europe, but you want to have a hardware wallet in Europe, a hardware wallet in America and a hardware wallet in Australia, you know, so that you actually need to go to all of these places to spend your coins. And so that's a great security setup to distribute the trust across different jurisdictions, so to say. Um, and of course, also privacy benefit. Nobody knows that you're doing this. Uh, and it also helps companies, right? What what if there's a group of people fighting a common cause and they want to share a budget, right? But obviously you don't want to trust your money to just one person out of the group, right? With multisig, you can just set up, you know, we're five people, so four out of five must agree, um, and only then can we spend the money. You know that uh, that enables a whole bunch of new ways to collaborate together, 
where crucially you don't need the state to inf to define and enforce the company uh, structure, so to say. Mm -hmm. You know, this is all done cryptographically. Like, if you just give me five public keys and I will send money to that. And, well, you can only spend it if four of you agree, you know, and there's no way around it. And there's no force uh, possible to, to, to refute uh, the scenario. Um, but, of course, multisig is, I mean, sure, you can use it kind of manually, quote unquote, either by yourself or in a group of people. But I think the, uh, these smart contracts are more likely to be automated in interesting ways. And then that is, for example, the Lightning Network. Uh, the Lightning Network does use multi-signatures, but it it doesn't only use multi-sig and it uses it in a really kind of genius way, right, with uh, uh, other stuff on top as well. Um, and there are other second layer protocols that use multi-signature. Um, one is, for example, BISC, B-I-S-Q, right, that's a decentralized exchange, um, kind of a second layer on top of Bitcoin. This uses multi-sig too, right? So you can trade anything for Bitcoin in a way that the person who has the Bitcoin and wants to buy something first puts the money into a multi-sig kind of collateral contract, therefore proving that he has money and that he's willing to spend it on the certain good and which the, the merchant can verify. And then later the merchant will send out the goods. Um, and the, as soon as the payee, the, the buyer has received them, well, he will just sign the transaction to the merchant and the merchant of course wants his money. So he's going to sign the transaction too. And voila, the, the trade is successful. The, the country band moved and the money got paid. Of course, if there is some disagreement among these two parties, we can get a, a specialist, you know, an arbitrator, a private uh, court system, uh, again, just referenced in a public key. And that, that expert can ar uh, arbitrate disputes, right? So the, the, the merchant says that, hey, uh, he never released the money, even though I sent the good, right? And, and this, this judge can analyze the situation and uh, make, a, make a statement in favor or against the merchant uh, and actually enforcing it, right? Uh, so this is, this is genius as well, right? This is, these are just some of the cool things that you can do with multisig and all of them get nicer and better, more private, cheaper, faster to compute, and much more flexible with Taproot. Uh, but it, it's, it doesn't just stop at, at multi-signatures, right? That's, that's one of the cool cryptographic tricks that you can do with Schnorr signatures, but there's a lot more. Um, one thing, for example, is these adapter signatures, kind of a weird thing, but Think of it as an encrypted signature. So th it's it's basically you have um, you can commit to a certain to a certain statement in advance, let's say, uh, and if you or and then in a second act, if you. <clears throat> Oh, man, it's it's tough to explain these these things just audibly and without right. visuals. But the, so I, the gist I, so of there, it is, there you... is so there, there's a there's a paragraph on adapter signatures in the Bitcoin Magazine article I can read real quick, um, which I, I think might help. But uh, um, because of Schnorr's linear properties, though, an adapter signature is as simple as taking a single, say the number is nine million three hundred thousand and thirty, and subtracting a value from it, say thirty. Once the party holding the adapter signature learns the subtracted value, uh, they can simply add it back, and voila, they have a valid signature again. So yeah, that's, um, that sounds, sounds interesting. Um, sounds like another way to do that, another way to do it. Right. Exactly. Right. So you, you publish a, a random looking number, right. And then later you publish another random looking number. But if you add these two random looking numbers together, what you get is actually a valid signature hmm. for something, you know, a, a valid signature from a certain private key over a certain message. Um, and this is a, a genius kind of pr cryptographic primitive, you know, one of the building blocks that in and of itself, you're like thinking, well, why would I ever do that? But then you can do really cool things with it. Uh, basically this will, um, or this is, this is one of the things that, uh, will make, um, for example, in, in lightning network, these hashed time locked contracts kind of obsolete, right? We, we will replace these hash time lock contracts with signatures. Uh, these adapter signatures um, and that again has numerous benefits because right now these so a hash time lock contract basically says i'm committing to a secret so i have a secret and i'm hashing it so it looks random and now i put that 
random hash on the blockchain. Right? And now I can only spend the coin if I put the actual secret on the blockchain too. And right? so that uh, the full node can take the secret, hash it, and uh, now you have the same commitment. And right? so you can validate that the commitment that was previously set up is actually satisfied by this new secret. But the problem here is that, of course, hashes are different to signatures. And that's, again, a privacy thing, right? So as soon as you use a hash time dot contract on the Bitcoin blockchain, everyone will need to verify it. And therefore, everyone knows, OK, this is a hash. This is not a signature. With these adapter signatures, we can get the same kind of concept. We commit to a secret, we reveal a secret, and something happens. But without using hashes and just with using signatures, so the cool thing is now we have yet another thing that looks indistinguishable, right? So we have single six and multi six and these adapter signatures, and all of them look exactly the same, but all of them do extremely different things, right? And now an outside observer just looking at the blockchain, he will see a public key and a signature, but what does that actually mean? You know, is that one person making a payment? Is that a group of people making a payment? Is that someone opening a lightning channel? Is that someone settling a discrete lock contract of, you know, some financial derivative or something? The, the possibilities of how you could interpret a certain piece of data is infinite. Right? But, but the verification complexity is, is much, much lower. Right? So this, this, again, it increases verification. It makes running a full node much easier because you need to download and verify and store less data. Uh, but it enables the users of these cryptographic protocols to do a whole bunch of of cool things that were otherwise not possible. Right. So so we're so we've uh, so I guess just to, to summarize, um, Ripley, if we've got more, um, you know, um, in, I guess uh, um, less storage use on on the blockchain, which is always great. Um, we've got uh, uh, we've got the the privacy innovations for where you can't distinguish what uh, you know what. Uh, you know what transaction you know what what what's what it shows up as on the chain it just looks the same uh, which is which is great i know one of the one of the complaints against lightning or at least one of the problems which seems to be solved now is that yeah that you can tell when it's a lightning ch lightning channel is opened um so that seems to be a, a another good um privacy innovation in the realm of lightning do you want to speak to um because it's i haven't really talked about it much on this podcast um but uh, do you want to speak a little bit to, I guess, to the to the developments uh, with with Lightning and maybe um, the increased privacy from from Taproot and, and kind of what the, what that could look like practically now for folks? Yeah, Lightning Network is it's magical, seriously. Um, and you know, I've, I've, I remember opening my first channels back in the days and you know trying to roll payments and it was just a you know, horrible only command line interface buggy as hell it took days to just you know compile it somehow <laughs> and then every payment takes forever and most payments fail um and there are like three other people online you know that kind of world whereas now the number of nodes is skyrocketing the numbers of channels is skyrocketing and the the stability and reliability of the software is just rock solid um I've, I'm now rarely getting failed payments, you know, they, they just work and they seem to be getting faster and faster, uh, which is a bit ridiculous. Um, uh, but the, the, you know, the thing is like right now, the current lightning network is really, I mean, a, a, a good proof of concept, you know, at most, um, and with things like, like taproot, it gets a whole bunch better, right? Because so again, we are using these multi-signatures and we're using these hash time log contracts, right? Both of these things get much more efficient and private with Taproot. But that's not only where it stops, right? You, um, you, you can now, for example, um, more easier um, kind of hide which channels you actually own. Or there are some parts in the Lightning Network where we want to make it expensive for people to participate. Right? That's basically the, the general way to how to solve kind of denial of service attacks, right? If, if, if someone just spins up a botnet of, of millions of computers and bombards your computer with messages, you know, well, what do you do? Well, for every message that is being sent, make it expensive to do so, mm -hmm. right? And uh, the original way or one of the original ways to do that is literally with proof of work right, that was invented by Adam Beck to make sending emails expensive. And so with every email that you send, the, the client needs to 
um, run this hashing algorithm a whole bunch of times, you know, consuming two seconds of or one second of of laptop CPU time, um, which is not noticeable for any regular user. That sounds like you know one mail every five minutes tops. Um, then you don't notice it. But if you send a million emails in five seconds, you're going to notice it, right? Um, and that kind of makes it difficult for people to talk to you. And therefore, only the people that actually really want to talk to you will will do that, right? And people who just want to scam you won't pay that cost. And so the way that we do that in Lightning Network in some places is that you can only talk to the people if you have a Bitcoin UTXO, right? So you have an output on the Bitcoin blockchain. Now, why is that? Why does that work? Why is that expensive? Well, because it actually takes time uh, and satoshis to create a Bitcoin output, you know, on, on the Bitcoin blockchain. Uh, you need to, first of all, have Bitcoin, um, and then you need to create a transaction that, you know, spends a coin and creates a new coin, right? And that transaction will probably only get confirmed if you pay the miner a reasonable fee. And that fee and the time in, in, involved for this can be used to externalize a cost for every single user. And right? so uh, for a regular user, well, you have a coin lying around somewhere, so it's not too expensive. But if all of a sudden you want to fake a million messages, well, you have to set up a million on-chain UTXOs. And that's going to be very expensive to do. And so that, this is kind of where we're lightning right now. Uh, a lightning node kind of reveals that, hey, I own this UTXO and I can even prove it to you because I can sign a, a, a message with the private key that is referenced in the public key of this UTXO. Um, but with Taproot, we can, um, because there's the actual public key itself in the blockchain rather than the hash of a public key, uh, we can compute cool ring signatures. You know, what I mentioned earlier, that we have like 40 public keys and I can t prove to you that I have one out of these 40 public keys, right? But you don't know which one. Um, stuff like this now gets possible. So we can have denial of service protections in Lightning, making it costly for the average user, um, but without sacrificing privacy. And so p the verifier knows that you actually have a UTXO and it did cost you to create that, but I don't know which one it actually is. And that's, that's yet another of these kind of counterintuitive privacy improvements of Taproot that, uh, that are not as obvious uh, at first. Yeah, yeah, that's uh, that's really great to hear. And I'll mention for... Uh, for Pasnia, well, founding stakeholders, at least initially, but um, Jamie McConnick's working on the Freedom Box still, or I guess the Pasnia library, and uh, do obviously um, plan on adding, you know, big, you know, full node, full node, lightning node um, capabilities, and obviously those are easily customizable too, but um, so if you haven't used lightning yet, um, and you're a, you're a Pasnian, it might become a, a, a an easier possibility in the future, and I also have the idea of, since, since there are, since there are plenty of van nomads who may not have the infrastructure per se, um, Obviously, we encourage everyone to run their own nodes and, and all that stuff. But for those who aren't set up infrastructure-wise, um, it's a lot better to connect to a trusted node than just a random one on like Electrum or whatever. So um, I will uh, that will be an, an offer for for stakeholders is yeah you can connect to the Pasnia full node, not just some random uh, some random node on the network. But uh, you're getting ready to step in there. Yeah, what, what, one of the other you know great ways of, of actually using Lightning uh, is for people who have a podcast. You know um, that, that there's this new podcasting 2.0 kind of specification that, among many other cool features like transcripts, you know highlights, trailers, chapters, uh, you know all of these things, it also includes uh, the Lightning public key of well people who are, appear in that podcast. And so you could say that Rayo the host gets fifty percent. Uh, I, the guest, get 20%. The editor gets 15%. And, you know, another, uh, like, 5% goes to the largest patron and another 5% to whomever, right? Mm -hmm. And now when, when someone is listening to the podcast, he will see your public keys, you know, and he can just, through the Lightning Network, send you a small amount of Bitcoin for every minute that he's listening. Or, you know, one time when you actually say something interesting. Uh, and that money goes directly from the listener, directly to the people who are who are contributing and creating that podcast. And then it's it's just absolutely staggering. Uh, for one, <laughs> as a listener, the amount of satoshis that I'm willing to spend on podcast 
is much larger than I would have thought, <laughs> yeah. especially when the content is good. And then as a, as a podcaster, man, like the, the feeling that you just sit in front of your screen and, you know, bing, new transaction, bing, a couple hundred cents, another 10 cents fly in, you know, it just continuously random people anonymously out of cyberspace, throw this magical cyberspace money into your pockets. <laughs> it's you know I, i'm speechless like seriously this is this is legit and the cool thing is this doesn't just work for podcasts you can put your music onto a podcast right just have a bunch of mp3 files that are all five three to five minutes long you know and that's just the song and an album how about movies you know on podcasts yeah. uh, and and again the beauty of podcasts is this runs on your own server and people talk to your server directly you know for one that can be really anonymous and that is also extremely censorship resistant, right? You're no longer being tossed out of YouTube uh, or, or hidden behind the algorithm, right? You're just, you know, there's your server and anyone can download the stuff. Yeah. Yeah. That's amazing. I've seen you post about that, post about that before, um, that service. And it's something that I've, I've been meaning to, uh, to, to get on myself. Um, I will turn my attention back to the digital or maybe the winner will be a good time to, a good time to do that. Um, but, uh, but yeah, that's, that's incredible. Um, love to see it. Uh, love to see it, especially, you know, no, no middlemen. It's all, you know, all peer to peer. Um, and yeah, that's, that's, uh, that's great to hear. Um, we've been going for about an hour here and we're going to cover, um, the up upgrades with Wasabi Wallet too. Um, so I guess I'll, I'll kind of uh, just. Um, do you have any other any other closing thoughts on on Taproot or anything else you'd like to to mention that you think is is noteworthy before we move uh, move on move on to this uh, last subject here? Well, one thing is that this is a this is a soft fork, right? So this is not a hard fork. Uh, where's the difference um, with a hard fork? If a user does not upgrade his software to reflect the new rules, that user gets thrown out of the network, right? You literally get forked off basically um, because your old rules are no longer in agreement with the new rules that the other new people are following. Meaning if you don't upgrade, you're off the network. With a soft fork, it's different, right? With a soft fork, you can, even though you've not upgraded your software, you're still on the same network. Right? Um, meaning that, uh, or but there is kind of one slight difference that this is a rule change still, right? We're, we're nevertheless changing the rules. So if you're not up to date, you don't know about those rules. And if you don't know about the rules, then obviously you cannot verify them. Right? So here is where it's tricky. Soft forks are not magically perfect and not dangerous. Soft forks can be extremely dangerous, right? If uh, specifically, right? If if because you don't check the new rules, you will not know when there is a transaction that actually breaks those new rules, right? There might be a transaction that uh, you know that has an invalid Schnorr signature in there, right? And well, you don't know about the rules, so you just say, okay, I don't care about the transaction. It's in a block but I don't know if it's valid or not. It looks okay to me. So I will just think that this block is valid. When in reality, all those other nodes that do have upgraded, they would be like, hey, that's a wrong signature. This is obviously a wrong transaction and therefore a wrong block. And so I don't consider this valid. Um, and now you're still forked off, right? Um, and that's, you know, that's, that's a problem. Um, and therefore, even though it is a soft fork and you don't technically have to stay, have to update in order to stay on the same network. If everything works well, you won't even notice it and it will continue to work. But you're kind of outsourcing the verification of these new taproot transactions basically to the miners. And a, a old node will quote unquote trust that the miner will just include a valid transaction. Um, and that's kind of, well, that's tricky. And even though it's very difficult to quantify the total amount of nodes on the network, some estimates are that only 50% of all existing nodes have actually upgraded to Taproot or to Taproot compatible rules, right? So I, I think those rules were merged like a year ago or maybe a year and a half ago or something, right? So some people just have not updated their software in a year and a half. Um, and that thankfully so far it was not a problem uh, the upgrade went smooth and miners did not produce a block that was that had an invalid taproot in it 
Um, but of course, you never know. Uh, so this is just a, a reminder that if you're using Bitcoin, you should still continuously stay up to date with the latest software. Mm -hmm. It's not just because of soft forks, um, because soft forks are very rare in Bitcoin. I mean, the last soft fork was four years ago, right? Um, uh, but it, it's it's also, of course, security things, right? There are numerous updates and improvements and fixes being pushed to Bitcoin constantly. Uh, so just in general, n not just with Bitcoin software, with any software, um, make sure that you're up to date uh, and probably also get some kind of notification um, set up for updates to critical software. And right? um, GitHub notifications were good for that, right? You can get just email uh, into your post box as soon as some repository that you're watching has, has a release, something like that, you know. Um, it, it, that's very much recommended. You know, you have to take good, tool, good care of your tools if you want to use the tools properly. Um, so just keep that in mind, make sure that you run a full node and that you do run it on an up-to-date version. Yes, and I guess the, the the last question I think is worth worth mentioning now. You said uh, half of the half of the full nodes on the network aren't updated, or they haven't been updated in a year and a half or whatever. Um, what wallets are ready for? I mean, or I guess um, how how can people use Taproot? You know, at this at, at this moment in time, are there specific wallets that haven't implemented right now? I'm sure Wasabi Wallet is is ready to go with it. Funnily, Wasabi is not <laughs> one of the few that is not. I'm, 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 I'm rather surprised that um, th that quite a lot of wallets already do support it. Um, BTC Pay Server, Sparrow Wallet, Moon Wallet, of course, Bitcoin Core um, are just some that I know uh, that already ship it, right? Where you can already receive to Taproot addresses and spend Taproot coins. Um, but most. Most of the good wallets are actively working on it. And so either they've already shipped it or they are going to ship it pretty soon. Mm -hmm. um, Wasabi kind of falls into that category. Um, we're most certainly going to do it. Uh, it's just that we've been hacking on this major release for like the last two years. <laughs> and we've put off all the other work for later. Um, and that's why it's not yet shipped right we're mm -hmm. we're right now only shipping kind of backport releases to our old version just to keep you know security updates and such afloat but we just don't want to make these major changes to the old software which is going to be depreciated pretty soon um so yeah but but that's the gist of it like um and the cool thing is like or another thing is that tamproot is better for basically everyone right it's a little bit better for single public key wallets, like for example, Wasabi, right? Wasabi just has single public keys. And there you can get some minor efficiency improvements with Taproot, like really not noteworthy, right? So there's at least not a, a fee pressure to do that, right? Whereas if you are a Lightning wallet or a multi-sig wallet, right? Or a wallet that uses a, a advanced script types and stuff, you want to upgrade to Taproot very quickly, right? There's a big financial incentive to do so. You're going to save right. a whole bunch on, of block space and therefore transaction fees. Um, so I, you know, it, it took a long time where the last soft fork to actually roll out. Um, and it, I hope that it's going to be a bit quicker with Taproot adoption, just because the incentives are, you know, substantial for certain wallet types. Uh, but we'll see. Um, so far, I'm happy. You know, we've seen numerous Taproot transactions on the blockchain, so there are users actively using it. It's cool. Awesome, awesome. That's good to hear. And and on to I guess the which which we just kind of, which you just kind of talked about. Um, yeah, Wasabi has been very busy in the. You guys have Wasabi been really really busy. Uh, you know, working on the on Wallet 2.0. I can't imagine you know trying to get that all finalized and then having to try to implement another soft fork at the exact same time. My only experience in this realm comes from Darklands, working on that for a year. So we didn't even have a product. So it was just you know lots of theoretical stuff. So I can't even imagine um, the actual implementation of all this uh, all this complex stuff so on that one um i guess uh, first off um i guess you yeah, have to really not really first off just tell us about uh, you know the the updates with uh, the wasabi privacy wallet what so what can people uh, what can people expect yeah this wasabi really has been a, a fun project since the beginning um and you know in back in the days it was basically adam fixor nopara hacking on his own in his basement you know getting some help from other people but you know, a rather small scale project. And 
then Wasabi came out and I, it was incredibly successful on, on numerous metrics, right? We have a, a bunch of users doing a whole bunch of coin joins. I mean, <laughs> there have been in, in Wasabi, we have over 200,000 fresh Bitcoin uh, that went through the coin join process. Right, that's that. That's a you know that's a large number. Um, that's kind of scary too, <laughs> that and you know, that that people actually use the software for mm -hmm. that massive amount of wealth. Right? It's, <laughs> I still can't fathom that number. Um, but the thing is, we've learned a whole bunch over those last four years, and we had this basic coin join protocol um, that was first kind of described by Gregory Maxwell in 2013 or something like this, the Chaumian blind signature coin join, uh, which we've implemented in the so-called zero link protocol. Um, and so coin join is basically just that, um, you know, you don't want to be forever alone. You want to have friends. <laughs> and if you make a Bitcoin transaction all by yourself, you're going to be lonely, right? There's just going to be a couple inputs and you control all of them. There are only going to be a couple outputs and you're also sending to all of those, right? So you're all alone, basically standing naked. Uh, and therefore your your crowd is basically non-existent, right? And anonymity loves company. You want to hide in a crowd. If you're the only one wearing a mask, you're the weird one, right? But if everyone is wearing a mask, well, then you're just one of the other guys. Um, and, and that's the idea of a coin join, a bunch of users making a single transaction together, right? So each of these users provides a bunch of coins in the input side of a coin join. And a bunch of addresses in the output side of a coin join. Um, and the cool thing is that this is a secure protocol in the sense that not a single user or even the coordinator can steal, right? Be, um, because everything is kind of atomic in one unit, right? You only send the money to the addresses if you sign the signature. And of course, you will only sign uh, the transaction if you verify that everything is all right, right? So you only sign what you know when you know that you don't get stolen from. That's a pretty cool thing. Um, but there were numerous kind of small issues uh, with our initial coin join implementation. Um, and that was, you know, when Wasabi first came out, uh, it, it just seemed like magical and incredible. And uh, it, it, is, it, it, it was great for, the, for that time, you know, but now four years later, we've learned a whole bunch and we figured out that we can actually go even deeper. You know, we, we can we can really improve this by a whole bunch. Uh, and so we did. And for well, well over two years now, I guess, we're actively researching on if we would start over, how would we do it? You know, and that we, we kind of took all the things that are really great in Wasabi 1.0. You know, that's, for example, the Tor integration. It just works by default out of the box mm -hmm. for everyone, right? Great. Basically, don't need to change that, right? Our way to synchronize the blockchain, right? So um, Wasabi is a light client, so it's not a full note. You don't verify every single payment there. But if you're not verifying, someone else is, right? So you have to talk to that someone else asking him how much money you have. That's an obvious privacy fuck up, right? If, if done naively. Um, and in Wasabi, we did it right. And so instead of sending your addresses to that trusted third party and saying like, hey, how much money is on that address? That third party, the, the, the backend server basically, gives you a short representation of all the transactions that are in a certain block. And he sends that so-called filter to you, right? So you're not sending information to the coordinator. The coordinator is sending information to you. And then you locally on your own machine check if there are any transactions of your in that filter. If no, forget it, right? But if yes, then you can connect to a different um, Bitcoin peer-to-peer -peer node, right? So you're not going back to coordinator. You're downloading from one random Bitcoin full node, just that one block over Tor. And afterwards you disconnect and destroy the Tor identity. Right? And, and with this block filter approach, you can find out how much money you have well, without telling anyone how much money you have. Um, and you know we have a couple of these things that are just amazingly great in Wasabi 1.0, like really next level shit <laughs> that we were in, in many cases the first to implement. Um, and of course, we're keeping all the good stuff, right? We don't need to, to fix a working system. Um, but where we are struggling is specifically with that coin join, 
And so there were, for example, a couple downsides with the existing um, CoinJoin implementation. And I guess the main one is that the cryptography of this protocol is only secure if every single user gets exactly the same amount of Bitcoin. And so these are these standard denominations um, uh, that every user needs to get a part of, right? If, if you've ever used Wasabi, you know that because uh, even though you send, let's say, 1.5 Bitcoin into the wallet, at the end, you're going to have 15 coins, each worth 0.1. And then that is because Wasabi is only secure if everyone, every single user gets that 0.1 denomination. That's great if you have, you know, roughly 0 0.2, 0 0.3, 0 0.4 Bitcoin, that's cool. But that really sucks if you have 100 Bitcoin, because then you end up with 1000 UTXOs, you know, and that means full nodes need to verify a whole bunch more UTXOs and you need to pay for those UTXOs to be created and to be spent. And so it's not just expensive for you, it's also expensive to verify. Um, and well, of course, it, it sucks even more if you only have 0 0.05 Bitcoin, because that's not enough to get the 0 0.1. And therefore, sorry, but no coin joins for you and therefore no privacy for you. And so that, that was a really bad, it, I mean, not really broken. It's just that it, it's just, that's how the, the cryptography of the initial protocol worked. Um, and some other quirks that if you would kind of consolidate many coins of you in the coin join, right? So, uh, you put five coins into the coin join alongside with the 200 other coins from the other people, right? But now at least the coordinator will find out that one person controlled all of these five inputs into the coin join. And of course that's bad. You don't want to tell everyone that these previously independent coins actually belong to the same person. And one of the other big things is that we have this, this change coming back, right? So, um, because everyone got the same amount, um, there was usually an amount left over. And so, you know, you have your, uh, let's say 1.5 Bitcoin, uh, and you get a 0 0.1 output where well, you still have 1.4 Bitcoin right? and it's trivial to link your 1.4 Bitcoin change back to your 1.5 Bitcoin input. And that's just 1.4 plus 0 0.1 equals 1.5. That's the so-called subset sum analysis. And that, um, that we also did not kind of protect against. So the zero link of Wasabi worked great, um, but only for those standard denominations. Right? Um, and that just, that was a problem mainly because it was expensive. We had to create a whole bunch of outputs. And only a few of those outputs actually got decent amount of privacy. Um, and so we took all of this experience and we were like, how about we design a cryptographic system that is secure regardless of which denomination are being used. And so in theory, every user could have a completely different denomination, right? One has one Bitcoin, the other 1.5, the next 0 0.5 and such, but on the cryptographic layer, they are still uh, privately protected, right? So even the coordinator um, cannot link uh, that two inputs belong to the same user, right? Or he cannot link uh, that two outputs belong to the same user. He can also not link that this input and that output belong to the same user. And so regardless of the denomination, every input that you register is unique and separate. Every output that you register is unique and separate. And, and, and therefore there's much less clustering. You don't need to reveal that all of these inputs belong to you, right? It's much more privacy. Um, and the, the cool thing is, you know, now we figured, okay, on the cryptographic protocol, we can literally do whatever the fuck we want. Right? Um, that's, that's great, but that also means, you know, with great power comes great responsibility. Um, because just because on the cryptography, you're all right doesn't mean that in reality you're fully private, right? So let's assume we have 10 users and they each have 0 0.1 to 0 0.5 Bitcoin roughly, right? And then there's the 11th user who has a thousand Bitcoin, you know, a thousand Bitcoin on the input side and two times 500 Bitcoin on the output side, whereas all other inputs and outputs are well below one Bitcoin. Well, naturally it's trivial to link that one or those two huge outputs to that one single huge input. 
And so even though on the cryptography of, of the client talking to the coordinator, everything was perfectly private, in reality on the blockchain, it's still not perfectly private. Right? So we have this great power that we can basically do whatever we want, but we're still restricted by kind of reality on, on the blockchain layer itself. But because we have a lot of flexibility, now we can finally think about how to optimize the amount of the inputs and outputs. How do we create this coin join so that it's actually private um, on, on numerous levels? Uh, and lots of advanced math that goes into this, but the, the gist is um, we still have these kind of standard denominations um, that, that look nice, let's say. So for example, you know, uh, one, two, and five, or powers of two, or powers of three, right? So uh, 10,000 Satoshis is one of those standard denominations, you know, together with 33,333 Satoshis, that's a power of three, right? I think. Um, and, and so even though every user can register whatever input or output he wants, we still favor to, to register these standard denomination outputs. But the cool thing is because we can now, you know, freely choose which one of these standard denominations we actually want to use. The result is that we create, we're, we're much more efficient. Let's say if you have a, a 10 Bitcoin input. We can break these the single 10 Bitcoin input down in, let's say, four or five outputs, where each of these outputs have the standard denomination. Right? So none of your outputs is actually change that can easily be linked back to you. Right? Uh, and, and that's really, really cool. Um, so we can now basically mix any input value extremely efficiently without any change. And that's, that's really something, um, because that was one of the big, big, big problems of Wasabi 1.0, right? If you had a lot of money, hundred Bitcoin, you get a thousand outputs, very expensive. Wasabi 2.0, instead of a thousand outputs, you get five or six, you know, that's, that's a whole bunch cheaper. And on top of that, you don't get a change output back that can easily be linked back to your input. And right? so every, every coin that you receive in a coin join has at least some level of privacy. You know, it, it might not be a lot, but at least it's something. Um, and that makes everything just so much more efficient. You know, in Wasabi 1.0, you always needed to kind of manage your coins and, and to label them and to see exactly which one was to change output of a previous coin join because those you actually shouldn't touch. You know, stuff like this. Very kind of mm, not convenient, so to say. But with Wabi Sun join protocol, Regardless of how many inputs you have or how much worth they are, you're going to get only private outputs and very few of them. Right? So you pay much less fees, everything is done quicker, and you no longer need to worry that much about which coins are you going to select, right? Because at least in theory, all of your coins can be private, like every single one of them. In theory, you can literally spend 100% of your wallet balance without revealing your pre-mix input, right? That's... That's really cool. Stuff like that was nowhere close possible in, in Wasabi 1.0. And so because we have now updated our entire kind of underlying coin join, and that leads to a drastically different kind of possible user experience, right? A user experience in the sense, you know, you start with one coin and you end up with a thousand coins. Um, and that means basically that we took that opportunity to completely scratch our old graphical user interface which was a hack to begin with, uh, you know, fun fact, that old graphical user interface. So Adam Fiskor wrote the underlying code of Wasabi, but he's not a graphical user interface guy. So he hired, or he got together with this other guy to Dan Wellmsley to write a new user interface. But the problem was these two guys only started talking, you know, a, a couple of weeks before there was a conference where Adam wanted to announce uh, the wallet. And so within, I think, a week or two, Dan created this amazing UI. Like it, for, for the short time that he had to build it and to understand those crazy complex things as not even a Bitcoin, right? Mm -hmm. He did an amazing job. But of course, in, in hindsight, it shows, you know, 
Um, like if you do a hack job, it's kind of debt. You need to repay it eventually, and you repay it with refactoring the code base. And that's what we're doing now. And so now instead of one guy having a week to finish it, we have like a team of eight people working full time for at least a year nice. on it, you know, and, and that difference, it, it shows a lot. <laughs> I can <laughs> you know, imagine. I, yeah. I, I was the biggest fan of the old, I was the biggest fan of that old Wasabi user interface. Seriously. I loved it so much. And, and now that I'm testing the new one, <laughs> like I, I cannot go back and use the old Wasabi. <laughs> it's just horrible. <laughs> you know, it's so bad. It's so bad. Um, you know, and it's it's not just that it looks more pretty, the new user interface. I mean, you know, it has much more animations, you know, small little things, you know, little things popping up here and there and just looks much more coherent, you know, a lot more beautiful visually. But where it's just crazy is the how simple we could do it, you know, because we can assume that the user does coin joins, right? Because, well, that's what the wallet does. Uh, and therefore, we can assume that a, a whole bunch or a large percentage of the wallet of the user is going to be private. Right? And if you have private coins that nobody knows are yours, then you don't need to worry or think about which coin you're going to pick. You just you can pick any one of them. They're all fungible. Right? So we could remove that entire concept of manual coin selection and labeling your coins and stuff like this. Because, well, you just pick a private coin and you make a payment. You know, and that, that reduces the amount of decision making for the end user drastically. You know, you just you paste an address, you say the amount, uh, and you click send, basically. And vo voila, <laughs> that's it. It's done. You know, you see a quick confirmation. And you, of, of course, you can still optimize it further and go more into the details. You know, see the inputs and outputs or you know, adjust the label of who will know about this transaction, adjust the fee and all of these things. Sure, you can do that. But by default, you probably don't need to do that. Right? You just want to make a quick payment and it's done. And the mm -hmm. cool thing is with Wasabi 2.0, you can make those quick payments, right? Uh, but you no longer sacrifice privacy, right? You, you actually can make a payment quickly and easily without having to worry about oh, who will know that this is actually my transaction and, and stuff like that. You just know every payment that you make, nobody knows it's yours other than the person who receives your money. Right, right. So it sounds like um, basically Wasabi two point Wasabi Wallet two point oh is uh, you know whole whole new redesign, um, upgraded uh, privacy with the coin joins and in, in, in numerous ways. It sounds like um, that's 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 incredible. That uh, is, is absolutely incredible. Um, I guess uh, was there was there any any other uh, any other features um, you think are worth passing along to to the listeners? And then also too, um, is it is it out? Is Wasabi Wallet two is not out yet? Is it? And, and if not, then when when will it be available? Well, obviously it's it's t hard to say exactly on that one, but um, yeah, if you got an idea. Yeah. So, I mean, you know, it, Wasabi is free and open source software. And you know, the code is in Git and on GitHub. Uh, so you, you know, you, you could run hidden wallets back in the, in, in those days, way before it was actually released. And the same is, is the case here. You know, we, everything we do is, is in open. Fair, Every single yeah. commit to the software is publicly verifiable. And, and naturally you can run the reckless code and, you know, crazy people like me do that. So <laughs> the wallet is there, it, it, it works, you know, you can use it. It's just, do you trust a bunch of, you know, random monkeys hacking on some code and maybe not properly reviewing it yet? Yeah, probably not. Like I know, <laughs> I know of at least, I don't know, 50 bucks in there as of now. So, and those are just a couple, you know, there, there are many bugs right now and a lot of things that are not yet optimal. So, um, I, I personally don't use it on mainnet yet. Uh, let's say it like that. Uh, I'm, I'm a very cautious guy like this. Uh, even though other some other of our contributors actually do <laughs> those reckless people, um, but uh, so mm -hmm. it, it is out there, but it's not yet properly reviewed, and and this is something that is going to come up, well, hopefully soon. We actually wanted to have done it in the past already, but well, you know, doing something properly just takes time. But eventually, we will have a public uh, kind of a release candidate um, with a kind of contribution game for the review. And so we want to get a whole bunch of feedback from a whole bunch of people telling us all the ways that we fucked up um, mm -hmm. so that we can fix it before we officially ship it and put our name on it, you know? Um, 
and and that's gonna come soon and you know sneak peek for for all the Paznians who don't have enough Bitcoin yet uh, download that testing candidate when it comes out provide us a thorough you know review and tell us uh, where are the bugs and where are the missing features and we'll actually pay you uh, we're gonna have a decent sized bounty um, to to you know help the people who help make that software um, so, but that's that's tough to say, man. I really hope we're gonna get it still in 2021. But yeah, it's it's a lot of work, you know. And and we and we want to do it right. Um, but the thing is, you know, like I'm already bull I'm bullish as fuck on Wasabi 2.0. But you you guys have, you cannot even imagine the level of bullishness that I have for Wasabi 2.1, or you know something that we do a little bit further, but. Because you know, it took us two years just to get to the state of having a, a a solid foundation, and I'm I'm proud of the foundation that we built. Like it's no, it's 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 good, it's good, but the foundation is not what excites me. You know, I'm I'm bullish for the skyscraper that we're gonna build on top. You know, and the things that you can do with Wabi Sabi is just incredible. Like it is as generalized as possible. This is just a a bullet board in cyberspace where anyone can come and build a Bitcoin transaction together. And then nobody can steal and nobody can spy on the others. Um, and what we can do with that is, is crazy, right? So uh, w one of the things that's going to come, not with the initial release, but b just because we don't have time to implement it, but that will for sure come after. And that's going to be things like, for example, coin joining with the keys directly on your hardware wallet, right? So oh, wow. right now you, you need to send from your hardware wallet to your Wasabi hot wallet let's say 10% of the stash that you have on your hardware wallet and you coin join, right? And then afterwards, you need to send from your hot wallet on the laptop back to your hardware wallet. And those are all manual transactions in between. Why? That's just uh, another potential to shoot yourself in the foot. So how about you just plug in your hardware wallet to the laptop, you configure on the hardware wallet itself how much fees you want to pay, you know, and, uh, and of course, if like to ensure that you're not making a payment to someone else, right? So the hardware wallet itself will verify basically everything that's going on in this coin join to ensure that you're only paying as much fees as you agreed to and that you don't send any money to elsewhere, right? Mm -hmm. So you can do coin joins without even trusting the laptop or Wasabi that you're running, you know, because the keys are on the hardware wallet and the hardware wallet will only sign if everything is all right, right? So that's, I mean, that's major, you know, that's basically you can have this server somewhere, you know, uh, in running or you just have an old laptop, basically, you plug in your, your cold card or some hardware wallet that will be compatible with it. And you have your hardware secure element, basically, that is, quote, unquote, unhackable, you know, and it just runs 24 seven. And whenever you get paid, it will automatically coin join, you know, and, and then maybe afterwards, it will send 20% of, of those coins to your phone, you know, 80% to your hardware wallet, ho however you want. Mm -hmm. That's the other cool thing. Because with Wabi Sabi, we can now create any amount that we want. Well, that means we can create payments inside the coin join too. Right. So, it, so someone, know, it almost never happens yeah. that you want to send a okay. payment. I'm, I'm with you now. So you, you, you input your, your coins that you want to coin join, and then maybe you want to send 80% to your wallet, your Wasabi wallet back. And then you just create, then you can actually send those coin join coins wherever you want to afterwards with the output. Since they can be any denomination. Is that what we're, we're getting at here? Well, um, in a way. It, it, well, well, so I mean, what, how you would do it in the past was you you have coins on your on your laptop, right? And and you mix them, and you the output address of the coin join is goes back to your actual own wallet. You know, it's it right. stays all on your laptop wallet. What we can do with Wabi Sabi is to say, um, you know, I, I want to I, I want to mix these coins, but I want to create one specific output that has exactly this address and exactly this payment amount. Mm -hmm. You know, and the rest of the, of my money, quote unquote, might change. Just break that up into standard denominations as you would before, right? Mm -hmm. So you just have one payment, one payment output that goes to the pizza merchant, and you get two or three outputs of change back. And each of these outputs cannot be linked to the payment, and all of your input coins can also not be linked to the payment output, right? because it's not just you making the transaction. There are like 300 other coins in there and you don't know how many users right um and, and you know the, the crazy thing is like this naive payment inside a coin join works with any merchant you know 
any like as, as long as you have a Bitcoin address from anyone, you can send that. The other guy doesn't even need to know that that uh, that you're using Wasabi a priori, right? Mm -hmm. But if the receiver is online too, you can make a coin join together with the merchant that you actually want to pay, right? So we have this large, you know, 300 input transaction. And of course, you have your inputs there because, well, you need to, you know, you want to spend the money so you can put money in, into the inputs. Mm -hmm. But the merchant includes his own inputs to too. And right? so he has some coin himself and he just adds that to the output. Uh, sorry, to, to the input of the coin join. And now the, the you, so the, the sender and the receiver actually exchange these uh, credentials, these eCash tokens, basically, um, that are used to coordinate the coin join. Um, and then later, the receiver, the merchant, can kind of redeem his token for an actual Bitcoin address uh, that you as the sender don't even know about. Right, so if you make a payment where the receiver and the sender together are in the Wabi Sabi coin join, the receiver has no idea which address this, uh, sorry, the sender has no idea which address the receiver has. And the receiver has no idea which coins the sender has. Hmm. Right, so this is basically ring signature with stealth addresses. Right, you don't know which coin paid you, and the other guy doesn't know which address you have. Like that is, that is incredible privacy that is so similar to what Monero offers, at least conceptually, it's, it's very different in detail, but conceptually it provides the same thing, right? But it does so without sacrificing the huge verification costs of Monero, right? Bitcoin is still easy to verify. And in fact, with these coin joints, arguably gets easier to verify. It's one of the other cool things with Taproot, by the way, um, with ECDSA, this old signature scheme. If you have a bunch of signatures and a bunch of public keys, you need to take them one by one. Take the first public key, check the first signature, second public key, second signature, and so on, right? And you go through all the thousands of signatures. With Schnorr, what you can do is you just take, you, you have 100 public keys, you very quickly aggregate them together, you know, to this batch public key, and you take 100 signatures and you batch them together too, and all of a sudden you have this batched signature verification. Where instead of making a hundred times public key verification, signature verification, you just aggregate once and then you verify once. Right? So verifying a coin join transaction is actually a bunch easier than verifying a whole bunch of individual transactions, right? Because you can efficiently batch it all together. Right. Okay. Yeah. That all. Uh, that all sounds. Yeah. Really. Really. Uh, really great. Um... Just uh, j either one of these things alone, Taproot or um, Wabi Sabi, would be you know just just great. But the fact that uh, yeah, they're uh, one of them's here and one of them's on the forefront. That's that's great to hear. That's uh, certainly great man, to hear. It, it, man, and you're right. When you put those two together, man, what you can do with that? It's like it's crazy, you know. Because with Taproot, you get basically private channel openings and closings of Lightning Network, right? Mm -hmm. And that means that now you can easily do that in a coin join too. Right? So you can close a lightning channel in the input of a coin join, and it just looks like a regular signature. And you can open a new lightning network channel in the output of a coin join, and it just looks like a public key. Amazing. Yeah. It looks indistinguishable from a regular user just, you know, coin joining to himself. But in fact, you've like settled an old lightning channel and you've opened a new one. Nobody knows it. Right? You can use these crazy multi-six schemes and nobody knows it. Right, uh, and you know that. Then one step further is you can do coin swaps into and out of coin joins, right? So you have we have multiple coin join transactions, and we have you you as a user have the input in the first coin join transaction, but you don't actually get an output in that same first coin join transaction. The output that you get is in coin join transaction four thousand seven hundred twenty three. Right. Mm -hmm. So all of a sudden you, you enter the coin join and you, it, it's like this magical wormhole or portal <laughs> that, you know, obliterates you and you're just out there in the ether and someone a couple weeks later, you know, you, you manifest again through this other portal and all of a sudden you're there and you're the only one that can link these, that can even link the two coin joints together. And then for each of these coins, right, nobody can link the actual inputs and outputs that you're interested in. 
Yeah. Yeah, well that's uh that that's uh that's that sounds incredible. I'm I'm looking forward to uh to doing some testing on that uh, myself. And uh yeah, hopefully we can I mean hopefully Wasabi can can be a, a feature of the Pasadena Library uh, Freedom Box thing that we're putting together. Um, cuz yeah, it's <laughs> yeah, it's if it's uh I, I'm hearing a lot of really uh, my mind's racing with a, a lot of really cool as you're just kind of running through them. Lots of possibilities. Lots of possibilities indeed. Yeah. Lo- looking forward to that. So, uh we've been going for about yeah. for about an hour and hour and 40 minutes here. I guess uh, do you want to any any other closing thoughts on on Wasabi Wall 2.0, uh, Wabi Sabi? Um or uh I guess uh um I guess where people can can go to to follow up with uh with updates on that. Yeah, just that that you bring up the Freedom Box. That's one of the other things that maybe will make it in 2.0, probably more like 2.1 a bit later, uh, but in a very powerful kind of library and RPC server that is very easily integratable f- with other wallets. You know, so so imagine that a BTC Pay server, you know, has just all of a sudden a plugin that if you install it, your BTC Pay server can do these Wabi Sabi pay to endpoint coin join payments. You know. Or there's a plugin, or maybe there's going to be a plugin to Electrum Wallet, you know, or maybe to Bitcoin Core Wallet, or to Sparrow Wallet, or Spectre, or s- some phone wallets, you know. Um, so not so not even directly Wabi interfacing Sabi with Wasabi, going. right? Not even directly interfacing with Wasabi. Exactly. Right. Okay. Exactly. Wabi Wabi Sabi is a general purpose collaborative transaction making protocol. Wasabi is going to be the first implementation of this protocol. But we're maybe even going to do a BIP or something like that and standardize it um, so that hopefully users of different wallets can nicely collaborate together. And um, also another cool thing more kind of for for the background, but of course, there's this coordinator, right, that the, the bulletin board kind of that brings all the users together. And for numerous reasons, including denial of service and actually privacy assurances, the coordinator gets paid a fee. But the cool thing is, we have these anonymous eCash kind of credentials inside our coin join. And now we can anonymously share the revenue with other people. Right. So let's say uh, here on the Freedom Box, you integrate the uh, Wasabi thing or Wabi Sabi uh, thing in some other interface, let's say. Um, and the, your users can anonymously kind of testify that they have mixed a certain amount of Bitcoin. And that they are, you know, Freedom Box users, um, where then the coordinator can verify this. He does not know which users from which coin join or from which inputs or outputs we're actually talking about. He just knows that this is a valid acknowledgement that 0.1 Bitcoin have been mixed thanks to the Freedom Box. Mm-hmm. And then the coordinator can actually pay the developers of the Freedom Box part of the revenue that the coordinator himself received to to make a secure round. And so this. The the incentives that we can do here is it's it's really crazy. Yeah, yeah, that's uh that's that's what it's sounding like. Uh, that's that's what it's sounding like. I I mean I I I you know read up on Taproot. I'm I'm on tw- the only I guess uh, the only fascist social media platform I'm on is Twitter now. Um, and obviously there's lots of Bitcoin talk there. From what I'd seen on, on Taproot and from what I'd read on Wabi Sabi, um, it sounded great. But uh, yeah, I think uh, yeah the, the the words you said at the beginning was 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 apt. Uh, bullish uh <laughs> certainly certainly a lot of a lot of good privacy and innovations and just more functionality in general so that's that's amazing amazing to uh um to hear so i guess uh wasabiwallet.io would be the website for wasabi wallet and then uh, obviously the github uh would be to where to go to follow up on the project yes the github is github.com slash ck snacks the company running the coordinator and paying a whole bunch of people to build these awesome weapons of cyberspace so CK Snash, CK Snacks slash Wallet Wasabi. My personal website is towardsliberty.com. Uh, just reach out to me if you want to talk, if you want to consult on, on some projects, some freedom strategies. I'm always extremely happy to help. And, you know, the, like, it's, it's not just that I'm a little bullish, you know. I'm, I'm that fucking bullish that it, it physically hurts me, you know. So I, I, I do need to release some of my, some of this energy outwards. So I'm, I'm always happy to talk Bitcoin and to, to get other people infe- infected with my bullishness. I, I don't know. Some, somehow this reduces the pain. No, I, I, I certainly under, I certainly understand. Um, I, I certainly understand, and I'll put links to all of these, all of these things in the show notes, and um. 
yeah, I guess uh, I don't really have uh, any anything else, Max. Uh, Max, any any parting words for uh, for for the audience here before I let you go? Well, live free uh, or die. You know, uh, manifest yourself to the greatest extent that you could possibly be, uh, and and help others to achieve the same. Uh, and I I think one of the best ways of doing that, especially in the modern age, is to develop free software. Man, these th these are, this is like. You know, we're just scratching the surface of the uh, of of what awesome shit we could build. You no, know, and I mean, Bitcoin is cool, Wabi Sabi is cool, Lightning is cool, but it's nothing. It's, this is all just a blip. You know, a small blip in the dust of of what we could possibly achieve. And especially because we have you know bullish as fuck people like me and countless others uh, who who dedicate their lives onto creating these these new standards and. Uh, to, to manifest this sovereign and free and private reality. <laughs> I mean, it's just a joke. All these central bankers, all the statists, they have no fucking chance against <laughs> the fire and the passion that burns in the heart of every one of us. Yeah, yeah, that is uh, that is definitely, definitely true. Definitely true. Well, Max, thank you so much for, for coming on, on again, man. I'm looking forward to next time. Uh, and uh, yeah, TowardsLiberty.com is, uh, is, is uh, your website. Um, yeah, appreciate it, man. Thanks. Well, thank you very much for the invite again, Shay. It's, it's been a pleasure as always. Yeah, for sure, for sure. All right, guys, and there you have it. Uh, Max Hillebrand, TowardsLiberty.com. Definitely go check out uh, his site over there. Uh, and, uh, you know, if you want to schedule a call with him about uh, whatever, I think he's got some some cool... Uh, last time we talked about some of the, uh, I guess, the um some of the uh some of the courses that he offered there um so definitely do go uh, go check out all of his uh, all of his stuff there um as for me uh, pazania.com is a website for all things the free republic uh, vanupodcast.com for everything uh, this podcast and liberty attack publications for uh you know strip books strategy guides anarchist agorist fiction uh anything like that or if you're an author looking for a publisher um liberty attack.com is uh, the site for that um so yeah, thanks guys. Appreciate uh, you tuning in. And uh, until next time, always remember, Second Realm is yours for the building and Vano is yours for the making. I flipped that around for some reason, but oh well, we'll go with it. Uh, all right, guys, see ya. That's so